If you don't have a sermon outline, these guys have already kind of made it through. Just lift your hand. You'll need one. And there's some right here, uh, Jose behind you and others. Uh, lift your hand up. These guys are going to circle back through. Um, I want to encourage you to uh, study with us the Word of God as we come to His Word. And we see Christmas in Philippians. It's kind of amazing. We often think of Christmas passages um, being in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, really in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and we think of the narrative of the Christmas story. But we see the incarnation not only predicted through the New Testament, excuse me, through the Old Testament, but we see it littered all through the New Testament beautifully, not only in the narrative of the birth of Christ, but also in other passages of the letters or the theological statements. And this is a big deal because the incarnation is a very big deal. Um, I want to say to you that in the growth group that we just did over in the ministry center, um, we looked deeply at what Jesus wants for Christmas. And we saw, saw that from John chapter 17. And this really is, for all of you that were in there, this is a bit of a springboard from that, but it's our privileged passage um, from the book of Philippians. You know, I never cease to be amazed at how God's timing as we study through the books of the Bible, as we study through a book of the Bible, that God always has an appropriate passage for um, even the calendar year where we are. And so, I rejoice in that this morning. We come to Christmas in Philippians. Notice with me uh, the passage that is here. Uh, Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 7 is really where we, go, where we are mainly going to be. Pastor Jason preached for us verses 1 through 4 last week. And we looked at the, the call of the Philippian people to humility and to uh, coming in unity and to compassion with the world that is around them. But in verse 5, we see something different. And I've seen, I've, under, I've underlined this for us so that we can see where the passage is this morning of our study. Based upon what he's just called them to do, in verse 4, let each of you not only look out for your own interests, but for the interests of others. And now in verse 5, we see, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. So this is where it comes from. It's the mindset of Christ Jesus. Who, verse 6, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. And then look what it says at the end. Read it out loud together. Being born in the likeness of men. You see, Christmas shows up in Philippians. Here we see the very picture of Jesus' being born into our circumstance, Jesus coming into our lives. Philippians 2 is, in fact, I have it here on your outline, Philippians 2 is one of the greatest Christmas passages of the whole Bible because here we begin to see the whole attitude behind Jesus's coming. Now, I am often amazed that when Christians talk about um, what Jesus did to save us, you see this on your outline, we usually focus on the crucifixion. And it is in the crucifixion where Jesus dies for our sins. He pays for our sins with his life. But we should recognize that it all starts with the equally amazing incarnation. Um, and this is where we see the humility in the life of Christ. Marcy and I served overseas with the International Mission Board um, for nearly 10 years. And we served at a time when it was really difficult for the IMB. Uh, the International Mission Board, um, the, there, was a, there was a kind of a bit of a a crisis financially in the Southern Baptist Convention. The economy had trouble during that time, and giving went down. And there were some, just some leadership issues of not knowing how to deal with that. And so, the missionaries really felt the difficulty. In fact, I was a field leader um, with, uh, with quite a few teams on our, on our, in our cluster that, I, that Marcy and I led, 
and we would have to fly to uh, a Middle Eastern country where our office was for North Africa and the Middle East, and all of the field leaders would have to come together and, and make budget cuts. And we would have these missionaries that were living out in remote areas, and they had, they had left, you know, wherever they were from in the United States with all of the amenities of the United States, and they were living in a hard area, and we just didn't have the money sometimes to give them everything that they needed. And it was really, really sad when sometimes we would say, hey, um, I'm sorry, but it looks like in this next calendar year, you're going to only have two tanks of gas um, per month. We just don't have the money. And sometimes, you know, in a lot of places of the world, gas is five, six, seven, eight, ten bucks a gallon. And so, um, you know, it's really hard when you look at a guy, you've, you've sent him out there with his wife and his kids, and he and his wife are witnessing to people, and they're discipling people, and they're needing to get up to other villages further away, and you're looking at him saying, well, if you're going to do that, you're going to have to pay for it yourself. Because we just, we just don't have the money. Well, it was during that time that um, we had um, seven deaths in North Africa, Middle East, of missionaries. And it was, a, it was a very, very arduous time. Usually you would get all the missionaries for each region of the world together once a year. We called it an AGM, the Annual Group Meeting. But it had been four years since our group had met because of budget cuts. You just couldn't afford to bring a thousand missionaries together for a week. Um, it was, we just didn't have the money. And so we got a notice, hey, next summer we're all going to be together. We're, we're, the, the money has come through, and we're going to be together. And so we all met in a certain country. Everybody was flying in. And I'll never forget, as I, Marcy and I arrived on a bus along with our kids and, and all of these other people coming in from the airports, and I was out there unloading uh, the luggage underneath the bus, and there, was, there were some other people working real hard. Lots of volunteers from the United States had come to help our meeting uh, occur. You know, they're doing child care, and they're doing other things, and even doctors seeing missionaries that couldn't get usual uh, good medical care. So, lots of volunteers that came in. But as we were unloading the, the bus, I noticed there was one older gentleman that I thought he was going to have a heart attack. He was just going for it. I mean, really, really going for it. And um, just serving and glad and happy and saying, welcome, glad you're here. And one of the many volunteers. And I, after we kind of got that bus taken care of and another bus was pulling up, I went over off to the side and I saw John Brady, who was uh, one of the vice presidents of the IMB. He's preached here, a uh, very good friend of, of Marcy and I, my boss for many years. And I, I saw John and I said, how are you doing? And he said, do you know who that guy was that was unloading with you? I said, no. And he said, man, that was Jim Meyer. And I said, yeah, he was, he was really amazing. And he goes, oh, no, you don't know how amazing. He paid for this entire meeting. He gave nearly a, a million dollars to bring a thousand people here to meet together, to be trained, to do medical for missionaries, and to retool and to send them back out. He gave a lot of money for everybody to be here. And here he was out there unloading the bus. Now, in about a billion times further than that, when we look at Jesus and we see him show up in the manger and we see him walk on dusty roads for 33 years with his disciples and with his family and with the people that are around him. And we see him rejected and then even go to the cross for us. About a million times beyond Jim Meyer, we see the Savior do an extraordinary thing. Now, part of the reason that when we look at someone and we're rather amazed and, and somebody looks at us and says, oh, you think that person's pretty great, you have no idea who they really are. I mean, you're just, you, you thought he was doing a good job unloading the bus. You thought he was just putting his whole heart in there. You don't even know who this is. This guy has given, this guy has given sacrificially that you might do this. 
You see, there was a, a whole lot more behind the guy who was working hard unloading the luggage. And when we begin to see who Jesus really is, we become amazed. And that is part of what we see in this passage. I want you to notice this with me. Number one, I want you to see that our greatest example of how to act is found in Jesus Christ or in Christ Jesus. This is what Paul is saying to the Philippian people. He's saying, look, you all need to be unified. You need to be humble. You need to be cooperative and compassionate with one another. Take on the attitude of Christ. Well, now let's start to look at the example of Christ. We want to see who he is and what he did. You see, underneath number one, it says, carefully consider who he was that showed up to do this and what he did and how he did it. Letter A is this. Jesus was and is and always has been eternal God. You see, just like I didn't know who I was unloading the bus with, I didn't really recognize that this was the guy kind of behind the whole thing. So much more when we look at Jesus without the understanding that he is far more than a baby in a manger, far more than even a guy who would come and even just give his life as a person. There's many who give their lives. There are, there's law enforcement, there's military, there's parents, there's mothers and fathers, there's brothers and sisters, there's strangers who have died for other people. But when we begin to see who Jesus really is, that this just isn't a person, that this is God, this is God in the flesh coming and doing this, then we start to go, oh, I had no idea. Kind of like that day when John says, you don't know who that was that was helping you. I want us to look and see who this is. In Exodus chapter 3 and verse 13 and 14, we see the Lord dealing with Moses and we see Moses describing, um, God describing who he is to Moses. Look what it says. Then Moses asked God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. See, this is, this is that picture of God dealing with Moses and about to send Moses out for this great task. He goes, what am I going to tell them? I'm going to just say the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they asked me, what is your name? What should I tell them? <laughs> Look what God says to him in verse 14. God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. You see, this is the God of all existence. This is the one who in his being, everything moves. Everything exists because he existed first. This is the one true God. Now, now notice in John chapter 8 and verse 58, Jesus has a huge discussion with the religious leaders around him, the Jewish leaders around him, and they, they wind up saying, you're just a demon. I mean, you, you think that you've come before Abraham? And with, when they say that to Jesus, Jesus looks at them in John 8, 58 and says, truly, truly, I tell you, Jesus declared, before Abraham was born... I am. So Jesus, the baby in the manger, was the great I am. And he claims it in John 8, 58, as well as numerous other places. Look at John 17 and verse 5. And Jesus is saying this, and Jesus says, Now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Can you underline that? Before the world existed. You see, Jesus existed before the world began. Some people erroneously believe that Jesus came into being as the Son of God when he was born on the earth. That is absolutely patently false in every way. Jesus simply came into human form when he was conceived by the Holy Spirit in the womb of Mary 
and then given birth. Look at John chapter 17 and verse 24, the one below that. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am. We just studied this in in growth group. To see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. There it is again. You loved me before the foundation of the world. You see, Jesus existed before time existed. In John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5 are some of the most poetic and beautiful verses of the New Testament. Um, the apostle John would write these words under the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And look what he says in verse 1. He says, in the beginning was the Word. Right above that, Jesus, or second person of the Trinity, or God the Son, any one of those. This is Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Can you underline that? Was God. It doesn't say He became God. He became something else. Look what it says in verse 2. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him. You see, that's God. He makes, He's the Creator. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. So, He is the only Creator. Verse 4. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And we skip to verse 14. Notice what it says. And the Word became what? Flesh. So here's the picture. It's not, that, it's not that God came into existence in this, but the Word becomes flesh, takes on flesh, and dwelt among us. And we have seen His glory, glory as the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. You see, those verses go with our key verse at the top of the page of seeing who he is. You can flip the page over and notice what it says. Same verse, verse 5, look what it says. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. And here it is. We've just seen this picture from John chapter 5, look what it, or John chapter 1, verse 6. Who though he was in the form of God, and this is in heaven, does not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of of a servant being born in the likeness of men. Letter B is this. Not only do we see that this was eternal God, but letter B we see that God the Son humbled himself. That's what he did. Um, He took on human form. Look at this. He He did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Right below the word grasped, held on to. He let go of that. You see, he had every right to stay in heaven. He had every right not to become a man. He had every right to continue as he had throughout all of eternity. But in God's grand plan, he humbled himself and he did not continue to hold on to that as, as something that had to be grasped. Now, here's, a, here's another way of looking at this. On the night that Jesus was born, the Bible tells us that there were some guys out in the fields. What were, who were that? The guys out in the fields were doing what? They were shepherds, and what were they doing? Watching over their flocks by night, right? So, we, we've, we've heard that many times. And then what happened? An angel of the Lord comes before them and says, hey guys, I have good news for you. Now they're trembling in fear. And he says, fear not. You know, when a fiery angel shows up in front of you in the dark night sky, you suddenly think, oh gosh, my life is over. This is it. And he says, fear not. I bring you good news. I've really good news because unto you today is born right over there in Bethlehem, a savior, and it is the Messiah. It's the one you've been waiting on. It's Christ the Lord. Christ means anointed one. So that means Messiah. So he said, the Savior has been born right over there in Bethlehem. And we just read this a few minutes ago. And you're going to go see him, and you're going to know it's him by this. He's laying in a manger, a cow's feeding trough. So that's, that's, 
that's a sign that, that they could, would, would be unmistakable. Now, what's amazing is just after the angels made this announcement, what happened immediately following that? A multitude of angels appeared with that one angel, and this is, I, I imagine they didn't all show up at the same time, so there wouldn't be 10 cardiac arrests out there. You know, what happened out in the field last night? I don't know. 10 shepherds died all at once, you know, whatever. Now, I think it was because just they could only handle one angel at first, getting used to this, and then the, the heavens are filled. A heavenly host says, glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace with whom God is pleased. Now, here is the picture of this glorious picture, a scene from heaven. Now, what is truly amazing, think about this with me, that Jesus, the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, the one who is the Word made flesh, Jesus is used to being in the halls of heaven, in the Trinity, beautiful picture of all of heaven and all of the angelic hosts. And when he is born into to Bethlehem, there's just one angel, and then there's a group of angels, and then they disappear into the night. Now, think about it this with me. That is the exception. It was only for a few minutes that that happened. It was only a little bit there. We see, we see this really big difference to where Jesus was to what is happening now. And what we need to start to understand is, is that in all reality, God would be justified to fill the heavens with angels at all times for the last 2,000 years declaring that Jesus has come. But that wasn't his plan. He had a plan that he was going to come and he was going to gently help us see who he was and he was going to show us his humility. He didn't come constantly declaring his royalty he came showing us the heart of God, a humble heart. Look at letter C. God the Son not only humbled himself, God the Son emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Letter D. God the Son was born into the likeness of humanity. That is mind-blowing, that he would take on human form, being born in the likeness of of men. Friends, if we will really consider the meaning of these words, if we will take a few minutes and meditate on that without the help of Hallmark Channel or Amazon Prime or Netflix or whatever, if, you, if you'll take a few minutes and be quiet this Christmas and reflect upon the truth, that's part of what Advent is all about. That's why we do that, to, to really think about the meaning of this. We will, we will be blown away that the creator of the entire universe comes and becomes a little baby. Listen to this. He comes down a birth canal. The creator of the universe comes down a birth canal and humbles himself to a helpless babe. Notice this. This does not mean that Jesus ever ceased being God. He never ceased being God. Notice this. This does not mean that, Je that Jesus was ever less God. Let me, have you, let me help you see what this is. This simply means he humbly submitted himself to the Father's plan for our redemption, which involves coming to the earth, becoming a man, walking upon the earth, growing up, being rejected by us so that we can see his, his love, the degree of his love, and then laying down his life so that we can really see the Savior heart of God. You see, we need to think a couple of things. We need to think here, ultimate humility. If you want to know what humility is, look at Philippians 2. It says, that's what he's saying. This is what humility looks like. It's God becoming a helpless babe, coming out of birth canal, being born into a, a horse's stall, limiting himself, restraining himself. In fact, that's the next one I have here. Think this. Think ultimate self-restraint. When you think about who is Jesus, 
Who is the second person of the Trinity? Who is this babe laying in the manger? Just, just look at that baby and think, this is God in humility and in self-restraint coming for a purpose. The purpose of the Father's plan of redemption. There's two major angles for you to think about here. Consider number one, uh, when we think about the incarnation, when we think about Jesus becoming a man, think about this. He leaves his place and form in heaven. He leaves his place and his form in heaven. All the majesty left behind. Let me tell you, a baby born into a horse's stall, there's no majesty in that. God being born as a child, God having a, a dirty diaper, God coming and crying, calling out for a feeding. I mean, there, there's every expectation that Jesus experienced all of our sorrows. Jesus experienced all of our troubles. In fact, the Bible says that he was tested as we are, yet without sin. And we know that the nails hurt when they went through his hands and his feet. He left his majesty behind. Have a quiet time on that. How about number two? Not only does he leave his place and form in heaven, but number two, he takes on simple humanity on the earth. Now, this is perhaps even more mind-blowing, that God would become part of his creation in this regard. And he leaves all the majesty behind, but he takes all the misery on. That's what he does. God, the creator of all things, takes on flesh, takes on our sin, takes on the agony and the sorrow. This is why Isaiah would say that he was a man of sorrows, and he was afflicted, and he, was, he, take, he took on our grief. Friends, when you think about Christmas and when you think about the meaning of Christmas, I hope that we will take time to consider what the incarnation really is saying. I made this statement here. I love these words. Look, notice what it says. It is extraordinary, amazing, dumbfounding, astonishing, bewildering, mind-boggling, overwhelming, and we could go on and on and on. To consider that the eternal creator of the universe would leave his place and form in his perfect heaven. And what makes it that much more shocking is that he would enter a sinful world, broken, rebellious, rejecting, and hostile toward him. And why did he did all, do all of this? For our redemption. He did this to save us. He did this so that we could see his love. He did this extreme thing so that we could see his grace. He did this so that we could see his heart. And when I do that, it just makes me marvel at the beauty of Christmas. It's a whole lot better than a guy in a red suit running around with reindeer that don't fly. It's a whole lot better. You know, whatever loot you get, salvation's better. Amen. Forgiveness is greater. purpose and the meaning of life cannot be compared. Eternity is glorious. Would you look at this passage? 2 Corinthians 8, 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, say, in heaven, yet for your sake he became poor so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. You see, 
That's Christmas in 2 Corinthians. Would you stand with me for prayer?